Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Arkanasa Radio Studios in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show, I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight, we're going to be talking about UFOs once again. First, this summer, I know what I saw. Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of New Urban Legend and Ancient Lore will hopefully be out July 16th, 2019. This is the latest book by journalist and cryptozoologist Linda Godfrey. Linda is better known for her work on the Beast of Bray Road, the Dogman sightings up in Wisconsin. <clears throat> I had Linda on the show last year. You can find the show on YouTube by searching Strange Things with Chris James, Linda Godfrey. For some unknown reason, the image of Linda is cut off just above her nose. I need to go back and fix it somehow. Guess I need to re-edit the, the video or something. Hate it when that happens. I was watching River Monsters the other night, and I had a thought. Now, I'm not into fishing. I've been fishing, but I just, I don't get into it. Just not my thing. I do love watching river monsters. Uh, Jeremy Wade has a way of making fishing more adventurous than it would normally be. I even read his book, which is not so much about fishing show, but the story behind the show. I highly recommend it. It's a good adventure story. Well worth reading. Wade had just hooked this huge catfish and was talking about how it was such a magnificent animal. And then he turned it loose. And jokingly, I said to my wife, I'll bet that fish goes back to the other fish and tries to tell them about being abducted by some crazy white-haired creature that measured it and then put him back in the water. And then it hit me. What if this was what the aliens were doing? Maybe they're not steadying people when they abduct them. Maybe they're competing with other aliens to capture, measure, photograph, and then release trophies. I can just picture all these flying saucers with photos all over the walls of people being held up by aliens, smiling at the lens to say... Look what I just caught. And every so often you get that alien that's not into catch and release. He's the one with the humans mounted on the walls of his alien cave. And of course, then there's dinner. Yes, this is how my mind works. It's scary inside. Before 1953... Unknown objects seen flying around were called by many names. A flying disc was the one used for just about everything, whether it was round or not. A Foo Fighters was used by air crews during World War II to refer to these weird lights seen following and sometimes getting very close to their planes during World War II. After the war, folks got back to calling them flying discs. Even the giant triangles were called flying discs. Then they came up with the term unidentified flying object, UFO. It really says it all. They're unidentified, they're flying, and they're objects. Well, now folks want to call them something else. And why not? Let's try to confuse people by coming up with new terms to describe something that everybody already uses. 
I stumbled across this one while doing research for the show. UFOBS. Okay, somebody wanted to put the mark on history by inventing a new acronym. UFOB stands for Universidad Federal de Oeste de Bahia. No, wait, that's not it. That has nothing to do with flying saucers. The only thing I could find that had UFOBS in connection with flying saucers was Unidentified Flying Object Believers. Now, I've heard that term, believer, before. I've been called a believer by people who found out I was into UFOs. I just don't think we need to use the acronym UFOBS for flying saucers or anything to do with them. I reached out to Ruben Uriarte and Noe Torres, two well-known MUFON investigators. They couldn't shed any light on the acronym. Then I got to thinking just maybe the OBS as stood for objects. You know how the government likes to complicate simple things. This might have been what the government was talking about. I think the BS was a part of objects, only they added the B and the S to the U. To make it sound more hoity-toity. If anyone out there knows for sure, then send me a message so we can all know. Or did the BS stand for what most folks associate with those two letters? I've run across other acronyms in the past that all tried to identify UFOs or at least how we referred to them. A UAP. Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. Yes, it does make sense. It describes what it sets out to describe. It's nice and short. However, do we need to change? Does it do anything to further the efforts to find the truth, as people like to say? By coming up with new and interesting acronyms, folks are saying they're different from all the other UFO researchers. More division is not what we need. Uh, how about AFO? Alien Flying Object. Well, yes, but we don't know if it's really an alien when we see it. If it's unidentified, we don't know if it's from outer space, or maybe it's the Air Force testing out a new stealth fighter. EFO, Extraordinary Flying Object. The vast majority of UFO sightings aren't all that extraordinary. Most reports are of lights in the sky that do some bizarre things, but really not extraordinary. Then someone suggested calling them visitors. Mm, no. To me, visitors are folks who come by my house to see me or my wife. They don't arrive in a flying saucer and they sure don't abduct us and take us in for experiments. How about we just stick with the acronym UFO? I was watching a TV show where the host was in Japan. He stopped by the local UFO office and, well, the sign was in Japanese tetagaki, and it made no sense to me. However, right in the middle of the sign, it said UFO in great big English letters. A UFO is identifiable in just about every country on Earth. Let's say we just try and keep it simple. I'm going to keep using UFOs until orders come down from the mothership. During World War II, the Allies decided it would be a good idea to build emergency landing strips for planes returning from bombing runs. If the plane was too shot up or in bad shape, then the crew needed a safe place to set down. The runways on these bases were extremely long in case the plane had lost its brakes or the pilots were unable to stop it once on the ground. One of these emergency bases was named Woodbridge, after a cottage located right next to the runway. 
1944, Operation Aphrodite needed a home base that was secure and away from other bases and in case the experimental aircraft had issues. Operation Aphrodite was a plan to use old beat-up B-17 and B-24 bombers by packing them full of explosives. The planes would be launched off the coast of England. Once the planes were in the air, the pilot would aim towards Germany, set the controls, and then bail out. The planes would be guided by remote control from a guide plane. Since there was no crew, and they weren't planning a return trip, the plane could be loaded with extra explosives. Once over Germany, the plane would crash like a kamikaze, only without all that dying for the Emperor stuff. Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy's older brother, died during one of these remote control bomber launches. Well, July 13th, 1944, was an unlucky night for a German air crew. A Luftwaffe JU-88G-1 night fighter was out on its patrol route late at night and early into the morning. Their flight plan was to fly out over the English Channel and intercept any bombers coming or going towards the coast. The plane was equipped with advanced radar gear and it could attack Allied bombers without being seen by their crews. The pilot noticed his fuel was getting a bit low and it was time to return to home base. He checked his gauges and set a course for Germany. He followed the compass and came into sight of the runway. <clears throat> the pilot took his plane down and touched down at the end of the runway in the dark. Once the plane had lost momentum, the pilot turned his aircraft towards the hangars. That was when he saw jeeps flying towards him and his crew. The plane came to a stop and was surrounded with jeeps and trucks. The pilot, co-pilot, and radio operator looked at each other and then out at the American troops. Looking down the barrels of dozens of rifles, the three Germans held their hands up and did the only thing they could think of, give up. It turns out the compass in the plane was malfunctioning. Instead of giving them a course for home, they wound up landing at RAF base Woodbridge. The Americans and British scientists had a field day taking apart the German equipment and figuring out how to build their own as well as how to mess with the radar equipment in German planes. I can just imagine the German crew as they wound up in a POW camp somewhere. Eventually, one of the other Luftwaffe pilots would ask if the crew had been shot down. I'll bet the guys that landed in England sure didn't want to admit their blunder. This is one of those times that you want to get your story straight and stick with it no matter what. <clears throat> December 1980 The historic UFO sighting that took place at Bentwander Bentwater Rendlesham, air base in England. This was when Lieutenant Colonel Halt had his encounter. Lieutenant Colonel Halt was at Edinburgh UFO Conference this year. I'm going to see if I can convince him to come on strange things if he has the time. If not, I'll put together a whole show based on that little occurrence. Now in August 1956, there was a report from Project Blue Book. It went through the United States Air Force in Washington, and a member of NICAP came across it. The originating agency was the 81st Fighter Bomber Wing in England. On the night of August 13th to 14th, 1956, 
Radar operators at two military bases in east of England reported tracking a single radar blip followed by multiple objects which displayed high speed as well as rapid changes of speed and direction. Two jet interceptors were sent up and were unable to see and track them in a brief series of maneuvers. Ah, correction, they were able to see. According to official Uf Air, U.S. Air Force reports, the sightings could not be explained by radar malfunction or unusual weather. The whole thing began at 9.30 p.m. when Airman 2nd Class John Vicari of the U.S. Air Force at RAF Bentwaters tracked one UFO on his ground control approach radar as the object flew 40 to 50 miles in just 30 seconds. This would mean the craft was traveling at 4,800 to 6,000 miles per hour. <clears throat> to give you a little comparison, a 50 caliber bullet traveling at 1,618 feet per second would be going 1,103 miles per hour. So this craft was going four times as fast as a 50 caliber bullet. The SR-71 spy plane traveled at 2,193 miles per hour. The craft on the radar was going three times as fast as the SR-71. The whole purpose for having the radar was to spot anything coming towards the airfield long before it was close enough to attack them. Even a sharp-eyed lookout armed with binoculars, would not have been able to see the craft even as it was approaching until it was right on top of him. It would have been easier to watch a bullet going by than to track the craft. A few minutes later, Vakari reported to Tech Sergeant L. Whitnery that a group of 12 to 15 unidentified targets were tracked from 8 miles southwest of Bentwater to 40 miles northeast, at which time they appeared to converge into one very large object, according to the size of the blip on the radar scope. The blip was several times larger than a B-36 aircraft, the largest operational bomber in history, that had a wingspan of 230 feet. The single large blip stopped twice for several minutes while being tracked before flying off the scope. At 10 p.m., a single unidentified target was tracked from Bent Waters as it covered 55 miles in 16 seconds. This worked out to be 12,000 miles per hour. Being in the middle of the Cold War, the first conclusion would have been the Russians had come up with a super-secret flying device that was very real threat to anything the U.S. had. That same night, at 10.55 p.m., the Bent Waters ground crew approach radar picked up an unidentified target on the same east to west course as the previous one, at an apparent speed of two to four thousand miles per hour. Someone in Bent Waters control tower reported seeing a bright light passing over the field from east to west at about four thousand feet. This would have been like looking at the tracer round going by. They put tracers on bullets so that pilots in the B-17s who were firing at enemy planes could actually see where their bullets were going. A lot easier to aim that way since you can't see the bullet. The tracers are cool, but they also show the enemy where you're at. <coughs> at about the same time, the pilot of a C-47 twin-engine military transport plane over Bentwaters 
It said a bright light streaked under my aircraft, traveling east to west at terrific speed. All three reports were coincided. Soon after, radar operators at Bentwaters and RAF Lakenheath reported a stationary object 20 to 25 miles southwest of Lakenheath. It suddenly began moving north at 4 to 600 miles per hour. There was no build-up to the speed. The craft simply started moving at 400 to 600 miles an hour, and then it maintained a constant speed for the rest of its trip. It made several abrupt changes of direction without appearing to slow for its turns. At 11.30, the RAF launched a de Havilland Venom jet interceptor, which had a tap speed of 640 miles per hour from RAF Water Beach. The pilot advised he had a bright white light in sight and he was going to investigate. At 13 miles west, he reported loss of target. Lakenheath radar vectored him to a target 10 miles east of Lakenheath, and the pilot advised he then had the target on his radar, and it was locked on. The radar, once it catches the object, will follow it no matter which direction it goes, so the pilot can pay attention to flying his plane. The pilot then reported he had lost on the target. Lakenheath radar reported that the Venom had passed the target on their radar, and now the target had begun to follow the fighter. Radar requested the pilot acknowledge he was being chased. Well, the pilot acknowledged and stated he would try to circle to get around behind the target. The pilot advised he was unable to shake the target off his tail and he requested assistance. An additional Venom fighter was scrambled from RAF station. The original pilot stated, It was the clearest target I have ever seen on radar. The following conversation between the two Venom fighter pilots was heard by Lakenheath, watch supervisor. Pilot number two asked, Did you see anything? A pilot number one answered, I saw something, but I'll be damned if I know what it was. Pilot number two asked, What happened? The pilot number one answered, He, or it, got behind me, and I did everything I could to get behind him, but I couldn't. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. The 1969 report by the Air Force funded study at the University of Colorado under Dr. Edward Candon, everybody recognizes his name, the infamous Condon Report, it said, In summary, this is the most puzzling and unusual case of radar and visual files. The apparent rational, intelligent behavior of the UFO suggests a mechanical device of unknown origin as the most probable explanation of this sighting. However, in view of the inevitable fallibility of witnesses, more conventional explanations of this report cannot be entirely ruled out. USAF Air Intelligence Information Report filed by Captain Edward L. Holt, August 31, 1956 not to be confused with Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. It's spelled differently. I must admit I got just a little bit excited at first until I checked the name more closely. RAF controller account by FHC Wimbledon, RAF fighter controller on duty at RAF Nettishhead, Norfolk. These British names. He said, 
I was the chief controller on duty at the main RAF radar station in East Anglia on the night in question. My duties were to monitor the radar picture and to scramble the battle flight, who were on duty 24 hours a day, to intercept any intruders of British airspace not positively identified in my sector of responsibility. Like my first general order, I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. Those of you in the Army will remember that, I hope. Back to the Chief Controller. I remember Lake and Heath USAF base telephoning to say there was something buzzing their airfield circuit. I scrambled a Venom night fighter from the battle flight through sector and my controller in the interception cabin took over control of it. The interception control team would consist of one fighter controller, who was an officer, a corporal, a tracker, and a height reader. That is, four highly trained personnel, in addition to myself, could now clearly see the object on our radar scopes. After being vectored onto the trail of the object by my interception controller, the pilot called out, Contact. Then a short time later, Judy, which meant the navigator had the target fairly and squarely on his own radar screen, and he would not need any further help from ground. He continued to close on the target, but after a few seconds... In the space of one or two swipes of our, scro of our scopes, the object appeared behind our fighter. Our pilot called out, Lost contact, more help. He was told that the target was now behind him and he was given fresh instructions. The chief controller continued, I then scrambled a second venom, which was vectored towards the area, but before it could arrive on the scene, the target had disappeared from our scopes, and although we continued to keep careful watch, was not seen by us. <clears throat> the fact remains that at least nine RAF ground personnel and two RAF air crew were conscious of an object sufficiently solid to give a return on radar. Naturally, all of this was reported, and the senior officer from the Air Ministry came down, and he interrogated them. Most significant are the reports of three courses of UFOBs, that thing again, tracked on the Bentwaters GCA radar. These UFOBs flew courses as followed. One group of 12 to 15 UFOBs from a point 8 miles southwest of Bentwater to approximately 40 to 45 miles northeast of Bentwaters at an estimated speed of 800 to 1,250 miles per hour. A single UFOB was tracked by Bentwaters GCA from approximately 25 miles southeast of Bentwaters to approximately 15 miles northwest of Bentwaters at a speed estimated to be more than 4,000 miles per hour. A third UFOB was reported as tracked by the Bentwaters GCA from approximately 30 miles east of Bentwaters, flying a westerly course to about 30 miles west of Bentwaters at an exceptionally high speed. That would be the 12,000 mile per hour UFO. <clears throat> the GCA operators making these radar sightings were of the opinion that malfunctions of the GCA equipment did not cause their radar sightings. The sightings also could not be written off as atmospheric interference. This information was obtained from the USAF personnel assigned to RAF Station Bentwaters, England, concerning visual and radar sightings of unidentified flying objects in the vicinity of their assigned station during the period of 2120 Zulu 
the 2220 Zulu, August 13, 1956. The reliability of all these sources of information was estimated to be usually reliable. The military and some government agencies will use Zulu time so everybody is on the same page. That way there's no confusion as to the report moves from time zone to time zone. Zulu time used to be called Greenwich Mean Time. On April 11, 1980, there was a public event in the desert at Arequipa, Peru. There were about 2,000 people there when somebody spotted a huge balloon-looking object in the sky. Commander Julio Chamaro Flores was there watching this object as it passed over the base. At the time, Peru and Chile were having issues with each other, and it was believed this might be a spy balloon trying to gather intelligence from the Peruvian Air Force. The pilot Oscar Santa Maria Huerta took off in his Sukhoi Su-17 fighter to intercept the balloon. The Sukhoi was a Soviet-built fighter. The fighter clomb rapidly to the altitude of the balloon and was given orders to bring it down, or in other words, fire on the object. The Sukhoi Su-17 could fly at 1,156 miles per hour, and it was equipped with two 30mm machine guns. These are twice as big as a 50 caliber machine gun. The fighter also was equipped with pods that could launch air-to-air -air missiles that, even if they missed the target, would explode near it, sending out fragments and fire. That balloon was toast. Well, as soon as the pilot engaged the object with his armaments, the balloon seemed to inflate itself, growing larger, and then it jumped straight up out of the line of fire. The rounds that did hit the target did no discernible damage. The majority just went by with no effect. The pilot swung his plane around and came at the balloon from another direction and once more opened up with his machine guns. The balloon jumped straight up once more, avoiding the rounds. Oscar used his air to air missiles, and even though they exploded near the balloon, it looked as if the fragments were being absorbed into the object. Oscar Santa Maria said the balloon began to flatten out, and it took on the shape of a saucer. It then took off and was out of sight in a short period of time. There was no doubt in his mind the object was under intelligent control. At around 55,000 feet, the fuel indicator began to beep, letting the pilot know he was running low on fuel. He had to return to his air base. Once on the ground, he was debriefed by his commanding officers. Oscar reported he had fired around 76 rounds of 30 millimeter ammo and two air-to-air -air missiles. The white balloon avoided all of his efforts to bring it down. He also said he could see no means of propulsion or any kind of motors. There were no windows of any kind and no means of getting in or out of the balloon. On the ground, the 2,000 or so spectators all saw the aerial one-sided battle. Commander Chamaro Flores became the Air and Space Intelligence Co-Director of the DIFAA the Departamento de Investigaciones de Fenomenos Arios Anomalos, or Anomalous Aerial Phenomenon Research Department. Commander Chamaro said he didn't think the UFO was hostile, and it may be just here to observe the Earth. 
He said the folks living in the area where the object had been seen say they see these things all the time. He also said it would be a better idea to investigate and study these flying objects instead of trying to destroy them. And I'm going to take a very brief pause to play some commercials, rest my throat, drink some coffee. Don't go away, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. The following is an ex. Did you hear a bump in the night and you think it just might be a ghost? Contact the Laredo Paranormal mm. Research Society at Laredo Paranormal at Hotmail.com. That's the LPRS for all your otherworldly needs. If you need to squint and hold things out at arm's length to see them, maybe you should get your eyes checked. Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, is right across from the Embassy Suites. Stop squinting and start seeing. Coffee, nectar of the gods. And at the Organic Man Coffee Trike, you'll find coffee made the right way. One delicious cup at a time. Stop on by 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. And remember, life is too short to drink bad coffee. Are you taking care of your skin? Or are you going to wait and see how time treats you? Take care today by contacting Lourdes James, Independent Beauty Consultant at 956-723-3019. Don't let time get the best of you. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back to the show. November 14th, 2004, the aircraft carrier USS Princeton noted an unknown craft on radar 100 miles off the coast of San Diego. For the next two weeks, the crew began tracking objects flying around the skies overhead. Some of these objects would appear at 80,000 feet and then plummet to just a few feet above the Pacific Ocean. The radar operators were at a loss to explain what they were seeing on their screens. A check of the equipment showed these objects were not some kind of mechanical malfunction. The weather was not causing these anomalies either. Uh, two F-18F fighter jets were launched from the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz to try getting a closer look at what was showing up on radar. When the two planes arrived in the area, they observed what appeared to be churning boiling water in an oval shape with some kind of a craft just beneath the surface. After a few minutes, a white object appeared coming up from the water. The pilot said it was shaped like a giant tic-tac, for lack of a better descriptive. It had no visible markings or anything to indicate engines, wings, or windows. The plane's infrared monitors didn't show any exhaust coming from the craft. As the two planes circled around to get a better look, the craft took off flying at incredible rate. 
Now, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate of Strike Force Squadron 41 attempted to intercept the craft, but it accelerated away, reappearing on radar 60 miles away. It moved three times the speed of sound, twice the speed of the fighter jets. The Navy immediately tried to explain the sightings away. The radar operators were seeing some form of electronic interference from either the weather or other electronics in the area. The pilots saw something other than what they said they saw. Some went so far to suggest that the pilots were both so inexperienced they were both hallucinating from over-excitement. Now isn't this just the kind of person you want fighting, flying around in a jet fighter loaded with bombs and machine guns? Anytime a credible witness reports some unidentified flying object, the authorities will quickly rush out an explanation, no matter how lame it may look after just a cursory examination. They do this not to explain away sightings to those of us who believe there are beings visiting our planet from some other star system. These bizarre explanations are to appease the folks who don't want to believe what is in our skies. If the government says it was just a weather balloon or swamp gas, a lot of folks will sit back and relax thinking there's nothing there no matter how many people see a UFO and are willing to say so. I've seen a lot of cool videos on YouTube showing what looks like flying saucers or some kind that can only be explained as being one of two things. Either they're genuine UFOs or they're really good hoaxes. One shows a flying saucer hovering next to one of the pyramids in Giza. There's what looks like lightning coming from the bottom of the craft and hitting the top of the pyramid. The craft can't be explained as being an airplane or a helicopter. It looks like a saucer. The person filming the craft was speaking in French, so I don't really know what he was saying. He could be saying, oh look, there's my brother-in-law's drone next to the pyramid, but... I don't think that's what he was saying. He sounded a little excited. Then there is a film of three objects that look more like flying trash cans coming down next to an old church. The objects pass behind a tree limb and the images don't distort as far as I can tell. The person filming is saying all the usual things like look at this and what are they? The conversation is in Spanish, so I was able to follow some of it. As I said on the cryptid connection, I speak just enough Spanish to start a fight, but not enough to get out of one. I have to spend a lot of time translating from language to language, and by the time I'm done, it's usually the next day. And someone sent a video from the Far East showing a boat-shaped UFO hovering in the sky as a helicopter is approaching it. The video looked good right up until the point the craft shot straight up in front of the helicopter. The chopper didn't seem to respond to the activity taking place right at their 12 o'clock. Had the craft been visible to the pilot of the chopper, the chopper would have banked left or right as the craft moved. Not knowing what direction the UFO might have gone, the pilot would have done something in an evasive manner to avoid crashing into it. This combined with the video suddenly stopping right after the UFO vanished. I would call this one a fake unless I can get a better copy of the video or the witness comes forward and tells what he or she, she saw. The trouble with modern technology is the better it gets, the better the hoaxes will become. This is why I lay so much credence on the Patterson-Gimlin film. Roger Patterson used a handheld camera 
with actual film in it to capture the image of Patty walking along Bluff Creek. A low-tech camera with actual film that can be examined for splicings and dicings. According to the National UFO Reporting Center, there were 120 UFO sightings reported in Texas in 2017. In 2018, the numbers were down to just 77. Now that's just in Texas, and only the sightings that were reported. I imagine there may have been three times that many that went unreported. Now this is just in Texas. The National UFO Reporting Center said in 2017... There were 4,655 UFO reports within the United States. And still, this is only what was reported. I reported my sighting back in whenever it was I saw those weird lights. Even though I was in law enforcement, I had hit the point in my career when I no longer cared what most folks thought about me. Give me my paycheck and get out of my way. You can only go so long before you wind up thinking this way. Maybe that's why they have mandatory retirement. The number of reported UFO sightings is seemingly booming if the internet is anything to go by. Every day countless videos of unidentified orbs or strange objects in the sky are uploaded online. But with new ways to report and share sightings come whole new levels of hoaxes and fakes. How do we separate the real UFO sightings from the guys with the CGI and lots of Photoshop skills? We just have to look at them and decide for ourselves which are the most believable. According to the National UFO Reporting Center, 26, 2017 brought them 4,655 reports within the United States. That does not include how many were reported to other entities. There are so many UFO organizations out there today that you have to flip a coin to decide who you're going to make your report to. I reported to MUFON because I know members of MUFON. There are a lot of people out there still today who will not make a report simply because they're afraid of what people will think of them. July 7th, 2018, a family spotted a black cigar-shaped UFO in the skies over Banbury, Oxfordshire in United Kingdom. The man is holding the camera trying to spot the craft. He then manages to get it on his camera. The craft looks long and thin, but the overall length is hard to guess because there is nothing to give contrast with. The object had a very narrow, cylindrical shape, and at times it appeared to either be reflective or giving off its own light. The light would run the length of the craft as if the outside were on fire or it was reflecting the sun. According to the witness, the object was pretty much holding position despite clouds that were moving behind it. There was also a considerable wind. He says possibly the uh, idea of a solar balloon was beyond thought. The craft was rotating end over end, but staying in about the same place. Near the end of the sighting, the craft flew upwards rapidly at a near vertical angle until it was no longer visible. What's more, before the witness could get his actual camera to record clear footage, the object could be seen flashing and rotating. This sighting looked very credible to me. You could hear a child speaking in the background asking what it was up there in the sky. The child asks why the craft looked like a tube. The father says it was cigar shaped. This is the standard descriptive for a UFO shaped like this. 
Then the child asks, how? The father says the craft might be a saucer seen from the side. The child asks, are you scared it might abduct us? Uh, to which the father says, no. Uh, that's a good answer for a young child. I wonder if it were true. I've talked to a lot of folks who saw something like this, and they all admitted to being somewhat concerned about maybe being taken away. The whole Whitley Strieber story comes to mind. Ouch. Now that's right up there. Makes me never want to have a close encounter of the first kind. A problem you might find when capturing a UFO on video, especially a cell phone, is as you zoom in, the object gets harder to spot. Your field of vision is reduced by the closer image. Then you run into the tiniest little movement of your hand is magnified a hundred times. A good maneuver to use is to brace your hand against something like the hood of your car or the roof. You can use a pole or a walking stick if you have one. Don't push down too hard whatever you're using as a brace. The force of your arm will cause more shaking. Just gently place your hand on anything to steady and try to relax. Now try to make coherent statements if you're going to talk. I hear it all the time. Oh my God, what is that? Oh my God, over and over. Just think, someday everything you video and say might be shown on Expedition Unknown or Monsters and Mysteries in America. How about Paranormal Caught on Tape? You want to sound good if you're going to be on TV, especially if it's your first and only time on TV. It might be your last time on TV. November 19th, 2018 report coming from Keller, Texas, which is just north of Fort Worth. The witness said at first the UFO looked like a cloud that stayed in the same location for too long while the other clouds went drifting by. The cloud looked as if it was shiny, reflecting light around it. Some tried to suggest that the witness was actually seeing the Goodyear blimp, but no one watches the Goodyear blimp for 20 minutes and thinks it's a cloud. A quick check of the flight records showed no blimp flights near Keller on that day. The video of the UFO shows a long, thin object hanging in the sky. November 9th, 2018. A woman was sitting on her porch reading when something caught her eye. There was a slight glow in the sky that didn't seem to belong there. It was already after dark and the moon was up. The light seemed to be reflecting off of something in the sky. At first, she thought this might be an airplane, but then she realized it was moving way too slow to be a plane. This combined with the lack of lights at the end of the wings. This would rule out a helicopter as well. The weird craft just moved slowly across the sky, reflecting light from the moon. As this unknown object got closer, she could now see it was shaped like a saucer, a flying saucer. This just couldn't be. She didn't believe in flying saucers, but then there it was. As she sat there in disbelief, the saucer suddenly shot straight up into the night sky and vanished from sight. Having just witnessed this event, the woman was forced to change her mind about UFOs. She moved from not believing to knowing they were real. March 26th, just a few days ago, two men in Louisiana were fishing when they had an encounter. The men were fishing from the bank of the river when it began to grow dark just after sunset. 
This was when they spotted a light coming from the trees near the house. It was a weird yellow light that shouldn't have been there since there were no houses in that area. The men walked into the woods to see what the light was coming from. As they followed the yellow glow, they came upon a silver craft sitting in a small clearing. The craft looked to be about 10 or 15 feet tall. It looked like an upside-down ice cream cone, pointy end up. The light was coming from the end closest to the ground. And there was a humming sound coming from the craft that sounded mechanical. The men were aghast as they stood there looking at something that didn't look as if it was from the earth. They watched the craft for a few seconds when it blinked out. It didn't move, and there was no sound. It was there, and then it was gone. The ground where the craft had been sitting was swampy, and nothing would have left a mark in the liquidy mud. I don't know if that's actually a word, liquidy, but that's what it was. Here in Laredo, and people have reported seeing something that resembles a huge cigar. It was last seen on the northeast side of town, just hanging in the air. It stayed in one place for five minutes before moving. It quickly picked up speed and it was gone from sight. There was no sound of any kind of an engine or combustion as the object moved away. About two hours after the object was gone, two military jets came through the area. A week before this sighting, a man saw a similar object somewhere around the Regency area. This sighting was at 9 p.m. This late at night, it would have been hard to see a cigar-shaped UFO if not for it appeared to be on fire. It looked as if the flames were licking the entire length of the object, making it quite visible. This craft was moving from south to the north side of town. In 2012, a report had come in of the same object. It was described as being a cigar shape, and it was covered in flames. I took that report myself from the person who had seen it. He is not a person that would make this sort of thing up. I've known the man for years. He was telling me the truth. This cylindrical UFO was seen and recorded hovering in the sky above Brownsville, Texas, in August 2, 2016. The craft was seen moving from left to right across Highway 48. The cigar shapes have been with us for hundreds of years. The same as those giant triangles, they're nothing new. People have seen them all over the world. Only recently, people began thinking flying triangles were something new. There's a theory that if you see a disc-shaped craft from the side, it might look like a cigar, long and thin. If it never turns so you can see it from an altered angle, you might be seeing a different shape, but just not recognizing it. The same would hold true with a triangle. If the triangle was passing by and all you saw was from the side, what would it look like? Probably a cigar. Aumuamua is the first interstellar object detected passing through our solar system. It was discovered by Robert Warrick using the Pan-STARRS telescope at Haleakala Observatory in Hawaii. There are too many vowels in Hawaiian words. Haleakala Observatory. This is why it was given such a name. Aumuamua means scout in Hawaiian. 
The object was first spotted in October 19, 2017, after it passed closest to the sun. When it was first observed, it was already heading away from the sun, so it passed right by our planet without being seen. Aumuamua is about 3,200 feet long and 330 feet wide. It looked as if it was a dark red color. As this space traveler passed by the sun, it showed no signs of gravitational acceleration. If it wasn't being affected by the gravity of the sun, what was its means of propulsion? Well then, somebody spotted an object on Google Sky that looked an awful like Aumuamua. If you go to 2 hours, 41 minutes, 32.38 seconds, by 7 hours, 53 minutes, 16.51 seconds on Google Sky, you can see an object that looks a lot like a spacecraft. The craft is 4,600 feet long and 400 feet wide. There is what some are calling a bridge or a control tower near one end. There's also an opening that is being referred to as a docking bay. Now this is a truly weird looking object. If you can't find it on Google Sky because you're not familiar with 2 hours, 41 minutes, 32.38 seconds, that is how longitude and latitude are given. This stems back to the days when people were sailing the seas in square rigger ships and you would determine your position by looking at the sun, then looking at your watch to see how many hours and how many minutes and how many seconds you were from the position that you were originally. Anyway, I'm not a navigator, but that's how it was explained to me. If you can't find this object, which I couldn't find myself, you can go to YouTube and simply search for Aumuamua, O-U-M-U-A-M-U-A, and the other craft will show up in the list. My nephew John sent me this information, so thanks for the message. At night, UFOs will usually appear as bright lights in the sky. I've been asked, why would a UFO use lights to fly at night? Well, the answer I've heard is, and this is coming from physicists, the light folks are seeing is probably the visible product of whatever power source is being used. Like fire. Fire is the visible product of combustion. The light seen in the sky at night is probably the visible product of the saucer using power. One reason a lot of folks never see a UFO is they never spend time looking up at the sky. Too many folks are so focused on the ground in front of them, a whole squadron of flying saucers could go by and they'd never see them. Now, once more I had a thought, and if I could think it, I'm sure the aliens have already come up with it. If I wanted to fly around at night and not attract attention to myself, I'd put lights on the craft to make it look like a plane. One green light on one wing and one red light on the other. Put a blinky white light on the tail for good measures. This would make a flying saucer all but invisible to anyone seeing it from the ground. It would be just another plane in the sky. And like I said, if I can come up with it, I'm sure they already have. And then people say, why would a flying saucer crash if it was able to fly all the way from Alpha Centauri to the planet Earth without hitting anything and then wind up laying in the desert on the Earth? You hear about small jets crashing all the time. But when have you ever heard of an aircraft carrier crashing? Those little saucers seen flying around the countryside are probably like their jets 
flying off the deck of a bigger ship. Something a lot of folks refer to as the mothership. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Tell your friends to listen up. Maybe they'll thank you by buying you a cup of coffee or something. Till next Saturday, this is Chris James. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree